Good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session. <clears throat> Today shall be the concluding session in ophthalmology with the last uh, 10 topics left over. And from tomorrow onwards, we shall make a great beginning of anatomy, which is our next topic uh, subject. So, we already have finished DNT. Now, today we will be finishing ophthalm. We are uh, about one week behind our schedule, but uh, the third subject will be anatomy after uh, today. So, we welcome our online students, Dr. Manu, Dr. Lavi, Amrita, Parvati, Priya, Sudam, and the students in Tirupati, Vizag, etc., etc. <clears throat> so, this is a patient with a typical cavernous sinus rhamesis. Today I didn't get time to club the photos with the PBD. So first we'll have one photo around and then go to the concepts. So how do you recognize him? There is a unilateral proptosis with chemosis and a severely sick patient who is febrile, is a patient of cavernous sinus thrombosis. Cavernous sinus thrombosis can also involve pediatric population. Whenever it involves, what is the very important and peculiar thing you are seeing? The abducens, which is responsible for the abduction of the eyeball, it is paralyzed. So that is the reason the eyeball has come to the medial position into adduction. So sixth cranial nerve is the part of the cavernous sinus. It will be bathed by the venous blood of the cavernous sinus, hence any cavernous sinus thrombosis can lead to multiple cranial nerve paralysis, which include sixth cranial nerve is what you need to basically remember. This gives you a bird's eye view on how the, where is the cavernous sinus basically located. So what you are seeing here is the cavernous sinus. And uh, typically you have Connecting the cavernous sinus on both the sides, a connecting vessel which is called intercavernous sinus is present. That's the reason whenever the cavernous sinus begins, it begins unilaterally. Later on in the clinical course, the infection gets spread across to the other cavernous sinus and then it becomes a bilateral cavernous sinus thrombosis. Then uh, these are the various tributaries. Superior ophthalmic vein, inferior ophthalmic vein, central retinal vein of retina. So that is the reason any orbital cellulitis or any pathology in the orbit to the central vein of the retina can spread into the cavernous sinus is what we have to remember. Then um, superior petrosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, they are also having a drainage into the cavernous sinus. So what is the significance of the super and inferior ophthalmic veins? Whenever there is any injury in the upper lip area called the dangerous area of the face, then uh, there is a transmission of the infection through the ophthalmic veins into the cavernous sinus leading to the development of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. That's the reason we are quite worried on. Similarly, due to its extensive venous uh, tributaries and drainage pattern, cavernous sinus is in a uh, very sensitive anatomical position, vulnerable highly for the proclivity towards uh, infection. Now, let us talk about uh, the cave in a sinus thrombosis, what are the important issues asked in the entrance exam? In anatomy and ophthalmology, the main issue about cave in a sinus thrombosis is what are the anterior, posterior, lateral drainages of the cave in a sinus? <clears throat> 
Anteriorly, it is the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins which will be draining into it and they bring the blood from the face, nose, paranasal sinuses and orbits. So, any facial wounds or erysipelas or any sty or a furuncle or any orbital cellulitis can spread into the cavernous sinus. Posteriorly, it is the superior and inferior petrosal sinuses. If you take the labyrinthine uh, veins, they open into the inferior petrosal sinus. And that's the reason any infection in the middle ear through the labyrinthine vein can drain into inferior petrosal sinus, which ultimately drains into cavernous sinus, is what we have to remember. The mastoid emissary vein, from the mastoid cells, mastoiditis, the infection can spread through the emissary veins. Superiorly, it will be communicating with the veins of the cerebrum. So that is the reason meningitis, cerebral abscess, anything can also spread into cavernous sinus. Inferiorly, it will be communicating with the pterygoid venous plexus and medially both the cavernous sinuses are uh, interconnected with each other is what need to be remembered. So what are the important things about its clinical picture? Most of the times it is unilateral. But soon in about half of the patients, because of the communication through the intercavernous sinus, typically it becomes bilateral, is what we need to remember. So the patient is very seriously ill, with a high grade fever, vomiting, headache, etc. etc. Now what is the typical clinical vignette, which is often asked in AIMS and uh, PGA exams? A patient presenting with chemosis, conjunctival congestion, with the proptosis, with the third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve palsies, and the edema in the mastoid area. What is your diagnosis? Cavernous sinus thrombosis. Out of all these clinical features, can there be one feature which can be called the pathognomonic clinical sign of the Cavernous sinus thrombosis, doctor. The edema in the mastoid area is there, no? That's called pathognomonic sign of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. Why does it basically occur? Whenever there's a cavernous sinus thrombosis, the mastoid emissary vein, which is expected to drain into the cavernous sinus, cannot drain. Hence, it will build up edema in the mastoid area. Hence, it is a very pathognomonic feature, is what you are going to remember. If you do the fundus examination, generally it is normal. Retinal veins will show a little congestion, bit of papillary edema will be there. But patient uh, overall being very sick and septic will have hyperperixia, meningitis. The thrombus in the cavernous sinus can embolize just like any other venous thrombus and can lead to pulmonary infarction as one of the complications. So how do you treat doctor? Antibiotics are the main sheet anchor of the treatment. We also give analgesics. Can we give anticoagulants because a thrombotic state? There is a controversial role for the anticoagulant because if you give anticoagulant, you are always taking a risk of bleeding. The risk of bleeding must be accepted while giving anticoagulants. So this reason the role is still controversial. Now, what is the common question in the exam about the differential diagnosis of the cavernous sinus thrombosis, doctor? Cavernous sinus thrombosis versus orbital cellulitis versus panophthalmitis. Yesterday we reviewed, no? Evisceration, enucleation. Where will you do enucleation? If it is endophthalmitis, if it is panophthalmitis, what you should do? Evisceration is what needs to be remembered. Now, if you look at the laterality, Invariably, a orbital cellulitis or a panophthalmitis is unilateral. Whereas, cavernous sinus thrombosis, it starts unilateral and it spreads bilateral, is what need to be remembered. Proptosis will be there in all the three, but marked proptosis is a feature of orbital cellulitis. The vision, typically, when there is a panophthalmitis, there is a complete loss of vision. But there is no such visual loss in case of cavernous sinus thrombosis. If you look at the cornea, panophthalmitis only, corneal haze and corneal edema is a feature. But you don't have it 
in case of cavernous sinus thrombosis or uh, uh, in case of orbital cellulitis. Edema in mastoid area is there, no? It is neither found in orbital cellulitis nor it is found in pan of It is only in the case of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. That's the reason what is the gold medal question in the tomorrow's entrance exam you are going to face, doctor? Edema in the mastoid area is the pathognomonic sign in the case of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. How are the oculomotor movements? I mean ocular movements. Typically, the sixth cranial nerve, third cranial nerve being paralyzed, there is a restriction of the ocular movements, very classical in the case of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. In end of thalmides, since it is very painful, that leads to the limitation of the ocular movements. In orbital cellulitis, in fact, there is a marked limitation because of the edematous extraocular muscles. Then coming to the general symptoms, out of all these three guys, the guy who is having cavernous sinus thrombosis is relatively sick, ill and an admission in a acute medical care is what need to be fundamentally remembered. So that's all the story doctor about uh, cavernous sinus